Hi, I'm Larry Bayonne, and welcome to Coffee Talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the chair of the Guitar Department at Berkeley College of Music, and welcome to another Coffee Talk. Um, we've got a big pot of coffee here, and we have Cheryl Bailey with us as usual. Hey, Cheryl. Good morning. Hey. No water today. Ooh, like you're hydrated. Today. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got Ben Cody, our senior coordinator. Hey, Ben. Oh, good morning, Kim. Yeah. And our special guest today is our chair emeritus, Larry Bayonne. Hey, Larry. Hi. I forgot my coffee, but I can talk. So it'll uh, be fine. <laughs> okay. So this is a special coffee talk because um, of the big project that um, Larry and Cheryl and, and I have been working on with the faculty for a long time. Um, our book um, that I'm holding up here, if you're watching, and I'll tell you about if you're listening, it's called Berkeley Guitar Theory. It came out this week, so uh, end of April here um, of 2023, and um, it comes out through Berkeley Press. And it is your guide to what we call the Berkeley proficiency materials, which is all your vocabulary on the instrument that we think you should know and work on when you're at Berkeley and beyond. And hopefully before you get here, start looking at it. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the history of it and how to work on it. And um, and what's in the book that's new if you had graduated from Berkeley or if you've been here in the past and uh, how we think of the the proficiency in general. So that's our big topic of the day. But um, I want to start, Larry, by saying, like, we started working on this book version of this in 2018 or maybe before that even. Wow, I didn't know it was that long ago. Yes, yes. Well, uh, you know, things go through uh, different, um, how should I say, uh, uh, phases, you know, <clears throat> talking about the book, organizing it, writing the material, and also congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so one of the things that would be fun, I think, to start with um, is, Larry, this book represents like the newest revised version of the proficiencies that really came into being in the early 90s right after you took over as chair of the guitar department and you made some big changes from what that proficiency material had been um, with the previous chair, Bill Levitt, because he had a sense of what was needed in the professional community. And by the time he left the chair in the late eighties and you came in, um, you realized that the world had shifted and made some big changes with Mick Goodrick and Rick Peckham. Um, and can you talk about that a little bit? Like what are the reasons you guys had to revise this, really this kind of curriculum of materials that we believe is important for guitarists, regardless of style? Yeah. Uh, the goal of the uh, final exams and the proficiencies was uh to make sure that everyone who went through the guitar program could do this. This is the minimum of what we wanted and how it would prepare them. Uh, it was uh, when I was a student, it was uh, very jazz oriented, chord solo oriented, uh, but the topics really didn't change. Some approaches did and some um, uh, voice leading type of exercises did change. And we thought, uh, Rick and I, and we uh, and the department thought that, you know, uh, we've been doing this final exam like this for 20 years. So it's, it's always good to look at your material and, and kind of um, tweak it to what we think uh, the teachers and students think are, um, the, especially the teachers think that is important for each student to go through and to be able to play and understand this uh, craft of the guitar, you know? And, you know, the, uh, the fingerboard or people call it fretboard, um, 
You know, I always say it's like a Rosetta Stone. You need some key things to know and and to figure it out because it's it's not visible. Right. So anyway, uh, we were so lucky uh, uh, that uh, Mick Goodrick came back to Berkeley and um, uh, he is the master always to me of the harmony on the guitar and playing the guitar and um, we asked him to look at the final exam material and the pacing to see what would be good to change and what we uh, keep and what would be good to um, um, revise and update and um, most of it was uh, the the structure of scales and chords and arpeggios and voice leading and reading um, was kept the same. Um, so we, uh, what was noticed by Mick is that uh, in the uh, uh, all right, we always had the major scales and the modes of, of them in the first semester, the melodic minor in the second semester, harmonic minor in the third semester, and had traditional melodic minor in the uh, fourth semester. Well, now, the what was called the jazz melodic minor or the real melodic minor that we did in the second semester, that's almost like the traditional melodic minor. Everyone's using that. And it was, there was uh, the quote unquote classical term of traditional melodic minor was, um, was really related to what we did in the second semester. So Mick uh, said we should do harmonic major. And we said, what? And he said, harmonic major, you know, those, that's another scale that goes over harmonies that we're playing on and gives us more possibilities of that harmony. So that, so that along with um, um, diminished scales and whole tone scales, this harmonic major scale really gave, gives everyone the tools to play on almost any type of progression. You know, so and he thought it was important and we saw it was and we added that in our fourth semester. We also used to have voice leading of one, four, five, one cadences. And um, uh, Mick thought that we should relate it to our scales. So he wanted to see. So we added and this was a big thing to add the triad. Um, diatonic triads through intervallic um, uh, playing uh, cycles cycle two cycle three cycle four five six and seven and do it in closed position and open position and this is what um, i think all of us teachers needed to work on before we gave it to the students because we we uh we hadn't worked on that especially the uh, open voicings and also Mick had this thing of, okay, we do, um, you can do uh, cycle two going up, but now let's do it going the opposite direction, you know, and so, and, and also cycle seven. So anyway, uh, those are the big things that were added. Um, we also had sight reading and we felt that um, you have to learn how to read first before you uh, can sight read. So we we added um, and uh, Rick and Jim Kelly and Mike Williams have always uh, worked on giving us examples for each semester of working on like a little etude of eight measures that that students were uh, are um, were and are responsible for and that worked out that people had to look at this and not say oh i can't sight read it they had to work at it and start to do it and hopefully their reading gets better so that they're able to sight read uh, slowly uh, and uh, I always said that we want guitarists to be a uh, as good a sight reader as a 
mediocre trumpet player, right? So that uh, trumpet players li live with uh, start with reading. Guitarists, we don't start with reading. We start with hearing tunes, hearing songs, soloing, learning chords first, you know, and all. So uh, basically, oh, and then the chords, the chords uh, we ask for now are, you know, we ask for um, uh, even flat nine, dominant seven flat nines in the first semester, which that didn't go till later on in the second semester. And, uh, you know, we, we have uh, doing um, going through inversions throughout uh, the higher semesters. It used to be that uh, for a performance major, uh, level um, five, six, seven, and eight, especially uh, six, uh, seven, and eight, looked a little easier than uh, than the uh, previous semesters. So, with uh, the changes, every semester is a challenge and something that we hope our students work on and learn and not just memorize right you know i think what's so great about this is like if you're listening about it you can hear that throughout the whole process of developing what the proficiencies are is i'm hoping that you can hear that the faculty and the chairs are thinking about what does everybody need all of our styles are so different, but what are the core materials that will help you really know the instrument, know your fretboard, and be able to play and then be as versatile as you want to be while knowing the guitar fretboard as deep as possible, as deeply as possible. And so all of these changes that, Larry, that you're talking about, some of them came right away in the 90s, and then some of them came over time, like the last 10 years or so since I've been here, that reading really developed because, you know, we talked about it and said, well, people aren't reading as much in high school. A lot of people are learning on their own or learning with different teachers. There's not a standard. So what can we do when people come here to get you comfortable with reading different types of charts, melodic reading? in notation and also chord chart reading and rhythmic reading that will be applicable to the things you might encounter as you come out of here to be a professional. So we put the book together to say, we're not going to give you the key to each semester. You have to come to Berkeley for that. We'll show you when you get to Berkeley, we'll say like, this is what you're going to do. And level one is semester one, level two is semester two. But in this book, you get all of the material organized by topic. So you're going to get the things that have been in there since the 90s, which are the scales and modes for major melodic minor, as Larry was saying, the jazz melodic minor, um, the harmonic minor and the harmonic major. And you get a two octave pattern for each modal root. Uh, which takes you across the fretboard and, and the whole fretboard will be covered by that. And then you can go from there and um, it shows you later in the book how to make three octave scales by combining those patterns. And then you'll get your triads across the neck and up and down the neck and all the different inversions. You get closed voice triads and then spread voice triads, which are beautiful and very useful. And then Mick Goodrick took some of the things that you may know from his Mr. Good Chord books, and he modified certain cycles, which are his voice leading exercises. That's what he calls them, the cycles. And we take you through them, like specific things, like Larry was saying, can you go up and down the fretboard with this beautiful voice leading in your playing? And then we go to four part chords and, and arpeggios, and then we go to reading on all the reading examples that we don't use in the final exams anymore. So you, you can't use the book to cheat on your final exam, but um, the faculty, Rick Peckham, who was the assistant chair who revised these proficiencies with Larry, he and Jim Kelly and Mike Williams, the professors, they write these beautiful examples now with other teachers too. And they're, they're part, you get them three weeks in advance. So you get them in the book, you can see what they're like. And then what Cheryl and I did was we added, we, we took all of the faculty who are current to the department 
and Larry before he became emeritus. And we sat and we said like, okay, we have that core. We're going to keep that. We codified the best fingerings we could find all of your scale degree information, notation information. So you can look at it as deeply as you, as you're able at any given moment. And then we thought, what can we add? And what we wanted to add, all the faculty thought were important is adding exercises about breathing. Note location on your fretboard. Can you find all the notes? Rhythms, taking a, a, a whole note and really breaking it down into every different subdivision in four, four time, then doing the same thing in triple time with, the, with your uh, triplets and being able to play on all the different subdivisions. And then technique, like how do you set up your body? How do you think about posture? How do you think about alignment? How do you think about your tone? What are some exercises just solely to work on your tone production with your hands, regardless of the gear that you have? And we put that in a first chapter called super fundamentals, because those are the things that people skip over because you think, oh, I know it. I know it. I've been playing the guitar. It's in my hands. But the more you focus on it, the better everything else comes. And then at the end, we asked, 15 of our faculty who are full-time to write etudes in their style that uses something specific from the material. So you can see, I've never played with harmonic major scales. I don't know what those are. I don't know what those modes are. Well, here they are now in a groove-based tune, and you can see how they work in the repertoire. Obviously, each one of those etudes is just one little part of what you might do. But what you have now are all the materials that Larry and Rick Peckham and Mick Goodrick started to develop in the 90s, you have all the permutations of those up until 2018, and then these additions that help you coach them. And then text that I wrote after sitting and talking with everyone over the years since that 2018 first meeting about how do we describe this? Like, how do you explain spread triads? How do you explain why you're working on these different types of scales and what they can do for your playing? And so... I really think um, Larry and Cheryl and Ben, who, you know, you've all been through the proficiencies in so many ways. I really think this is like a book for life. It's like you can take this and put it next to your Bill Levitt modern method of guitar and you could put it next to mixed advancing guitarist and say, like, you could just take this and just continuously work on these materials. I think as we've all done. Um, and Cheryl, I'm wondering what you think about that aspect of, of having it in one place and then going back to it over and over again. What's your thought on that? Yeah, well, it, it, that is, that's sort of the, uh, the trio of books, right, of, that I would say would be essential without a doubt. I mean, I came through, I'm a product of Berkeley in the proficiencies when I was here in the 80s. And, and then, you know, it was very much based in, in William Levitt's um, philosophy and pedagogy. And I think it was incredibly thorough. And I recommend it all the time to, to anyone who's, if you're really serious, this will lay it out for you. So I think this also, what I wanted to also add on to what you're saying about, for instance, the supplemental material written by faculty it shows you that it's not this stuff is not genre based in a, you know sometimes i think because berkeley does have a history of being a jazz school people think oh well i don't need to know that because i'm not a jazz player but this is stuff that's universal to music and so having an etude written by joe stump or an etude written by Jeffrey Lockhart or Dave Fusinski or any of these great professors in their style using the material shows you that this is these are universal keys to the guitar universe. Mm -hmm. You can unlock those doors. So um, I think that's that's uh, yeah. I'm I think this is a really great. I'm really excited about this whole project. I think it's amazing, and people are gonna people should really check it out they'll get a lot out of it yeah i think that i want to second that as a classical player because we know we can read really well and we know the fretboard in a certain way and then in another way it can feel like a real mystery to us and um this was really important for me and just my overall musicianship and the funny thing is you don't think about it this way but 
by learning all of these patterns and learning some of the keys to improvisation and the chord voicings and things, I actually became much better reader. I was already a really good reader, but now when I look at something, it's almost like the first time I play it, I'm way farther ahead because I can see the structure in a different way. So I think there's this unexpected benefits. And, and what I would say to people listening, thinking about already, like, how will this work for me? Some of the answer is you don't know yet until you really get in and trust the materials. Um, one of the other things we added was a whole chapter on dyads, which are just your intervals because so many students were coming with just big chord shapes and didn't realize like, oh, there's a fifth in there and there's a sixth in there. And what's the shape for that? And then when you want to go and you don't want to play the whole chord, can you take it apart and know where you are? And that seemed really helpful to people of all different styles. When you think about it a little bit, we're all doing that type of thing. Um, well, that's, you know, thinking about that with the intervals and, and how important that is, you know, I think it was Gene Burton Sheeney said something like the guitar is a little, it's a little big band or a small orchestra. But if you don't know all the elements of the orchestra, you can't orchestrate with it. So in studying all those things, you're uncovering really a whole world of music is on the guitar. We have it all there. We can play intervals, single note, we can play them, you know, together we can play chords we can play arpeggios which are broken chords any of these things that are you know it's a really a band you have a band in your hand if you know if you can learn all the parts in it you know yeah i mean the other thing that turned out to be kind of a joke and i i can't remember if i stole it for someone or i said it myself the first time was that Students are always asking, like, you know, when you have this as a test, you know, when you formalize something like this and you put it in a book or you put it in the test, people are like, is this the chicken or the egg? You know, and and like it's important to remember that it's not the egg where it might one day grow into something important or hatch into something important. It's like the chickens went out and they got gigs and then they came back all together and they said, like, what? should I have known? What do I wish I knew in order to get more gigs? And then they wrote the proficiency. So one of the students started saying, you have to trust the chickens. Like you have to trust all the faculty who wrote this book that they are writing it for you to show you the things that, that you really will need. And that takes me to Ben. Um, you are a fairly recent alum and you're a rock guitar player. And you went through these materials. And can you talk a little bit for a minute about how they helped you know know the fretboard in your style? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm a little jealous that this didn't come out a few years earlier because uh, I mean, when before I came to Berkeley, you know, I, I kind of grew up musically, so to speak, you know, playing and playing rock and roll and you know different bars and clubs. So I would have loved to have had you know uh, you know these materials to kind of help me prepare and then kind of know what to expect coming in because I know I've talked about this on previous coffee talks, but like my first couple semesters, I kind of felt like I was playing catch up a little bit because, you know, I really wasn't a reader at all. <laughs> I was going to say a strong reader, but I really wasn't a reader at all. Um, you know, and just to kind of have, uh, you know, a very accessible, um, you know, avenue into kind of how to prepare myself to be able to, to have gotten the most out of Berkeley. Um, I think it's a really powerful tool that, you know, like I said, like, like I said I'm a little jealous of it. <laughs> I think that's a good point. I mean, what we also did, it was on the back of the book, we asked some alumni um, who have gone on to make big lists, you know, top guitarists of the century and that sort of list, and also won Grammys to, to review the book before we put it out, just to see, you know, what they thought. And, and almost all of them said, you know, actually all of them said, I will use it now. It's a lifelong tool. So you can use it before you come here. You can use it while you're here. And then, I mean, I'm using this material in my practice and I know that all the faculty are. It's not something that you graduate from really. Um, and Larry, this is a question I have for you because in the interview you gave in the beginning of the book talking about it, you were talking about this idea that people have where they say like, well, why do I have to learn certain fingerings? And you made this great point. Well, ultimately the fretboard becomes one big fingering, right? But in the beginning, it's really good to have something to hang on to and to have a system 
so that you have something to work with in your language. Uh, can you talk about that? Like how you use and you suggest that people use these materials and really dig into the way they're presented in the proficiencies? You know, I forgot that about that interview. I forgot I said that. <laughs> Am I sorry I said that? No, I'm happy I said that. <laughs> uh, you know, um, many people, um, I, I've, I've known guitars that have per, perfect pitch. Mm -hmm. And but when they go and play something, it doesn't come out cleanly because they haven't worked out how to navigate on the instrument. So that I mean, there's there's the right notes, the right, uh, the right the rhythms, but then there's the right sound and the control. And uh, having uh, fingerings that you become f um, familiar and you know and it's second nature to you is a great way of choosing how to play a certain phrase well and how to have it sound well. So uh, what I'm hoping that every guitarist has is uh, they have choices of how to play things and where to play things and this is a beginning of that learning these uh sure while you're working on this book you say well i could use this type of uh, uh method to work out other fingerings you know it's it's not that 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 we uh, at berkeley want you to have one set of fingerings, but this is really where it starts, right? And it's um, playing guitar is a lifelong process, you know, and there uh, you learn something and it's exciting and then you get tired of it and sick of that sound. Like uh, I use this on every dominant seven chord. Well, that's good that you have that first, but then it's great when you get sick of it and change it. You know, and look at another way of, of doing things. So, um, and I wanted to mention something about our final exams uh, or proficiencies. I go back and forth saying this. Uh, second semester, melodic minor, that's where everyone hits, you know, oh, the first semester is major scales. Yeah, I've had my major scales. Melodic minors are uh, the way, you know, with the natural, with the a raise six and seven, you can call it. It's a hard scale to hear at first. We want to hear a natural minor or a Dorian scale, which are all connected to the um, to the major scale modes of the major scale. But hearing the um, starting to play melodic minor is like um, where uh, people go. Oh, I'm having more problems with this. So it's good to get the sound in your and and going through it and see the differences. We have fingerings in this book, you know, uh, tab, but also I suggest that everyone know the notes they're playing. We because... also did not put tab in here. There's no tab. There's only fingerings because we oh, don't... I'm sorry, not uh, no tab fingerings. at Berkeley. No right. more tab. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Good, because I have more problems reading tab than notes. Right, yeah. and tab, and the reason why everyone that we don't use tab is because it's not universal to other instruments, and because it robs you sometimes from other choices that you can make and seeing yeah. other choices. We want you to see right. the notes. We want you to see that that scale degree, and then you know fingerings kind of are a little bit of a substitute for tab sometimes. But anyway, go ahead. It gets you started. I mean the fingerings, yeah. but then. After you go, you know, it's good to get the fingerings and then you start looking at the notes. Mm -hmm. Then you start looking at what changes from one mode to the next or one type of mode to the next. And uh, and it's all with uh, knowing the notes and your ears. You start getting them in your ears and you start playing them. Um, I'm glad you mentioned triads. I forgot to mention that we forgot that uh, what was revised was also the triads, having uh, open triads and closed triads. And um, so um, triads are beautiful and can be used many ways. It's, it's, it's not, oh, I know triads yeah, already. 
try it out and you'll find out the, the beautiful sounds that you can get with triads and how different ways of using them. Um, it also is great. It's like having your teacher. The teacher's job has always been um, private lesson and it will continue when you come to Berkeley. How do I use this material in, in a musical way? And um, this is a great start by having different etudes by um, uh, faculty and professors of, of, uh, with different styles um, showing you how, how important this material is. There are two things that you said that I wanted to touch on. And one is that giant gap to go from the major scale modes to the melodic minor modes. It's not just the sound. It's also that there's a lack of awareness that everyone has when you say you know something. You're really familiar with the way that you play it. But you might know the major scale, but you might not know where the third degree is. And that's the difference between the major scale and the jazz melodic minor is that you flat the third. And if you knew every time you played that third degree, no matter what pattern you were in, no matter what mode you were in, that parent scale third degree, if you knew where that was in your fingering, all you would have to do is move it down one fret. But what people find so fast, and I'm watching Ben nod about this, is that you play these patterns and you don't think about what you're playing ever as you're practicing it. And that catches a lot of students off guard. And so some of it is, if, even if you're saying, well, I'm never going to play in that. I don't think I'm ever going to play in that. I love this music over here and it doesn't ever go there. Well, isn't it great that, that, that learning this scale would allow you to know the major scale so well that you would know what to alter. And that's part of it too, right? Like, you know, when you learn all your chords, you learn which notes move when you get a different sonic quality. And it's not just that you're memorizing shapes and that becomes a really big deal, I think. Um, and then the second thing, Larry, is something that we talked about a lot, you and I, when the idea for this project came up, like, we were going to do the proficiency review anyway, because it was time to make sure there weren't things we were missing and to make sure everything was still relevant for students. But the idea of putting it in a book that anyone could buy was this idea of like, well, you know, sometimes there's this mystique around the Berkeley Guitar Department curriculum and what is it and is it special to Berkeley and what would happen if we made it public and welcomed other people into looking at it and welcomed students early. And I remember you used the Rosetta Stone um, analogy, like this is the Rosetta Stone in a lot of ways that we use, but the way we use it here, I mean, you have to use it. You know, and I think the way we use it here in the classroom is unique. And it is a way that you'll only get at Berkeley because of the way that you sit with your teacher in your private lesson and you go through each level. What's not in the book is the way we organize it here in the curriculum and the way that the teachers take the students through it in the lessons and labs and ensembles to apply it to their musicianship. So anyone can take it. Um, but it's not just having the book, it's the way you use it. And I, I think that's really significant. And um, so it's important for all of us as guitarists, no matter where you go to school. And then at Berkeley, we try to take this as the foundational material. And, and, and we really have worked hard to make hundreds of classes each semester that specifically apply this information. And that's the next level of it, I think. Um, is that how you think of it, Larry and Cheryl? Like maybe Larry first and then Cheryl and Ben. Like what's the relationship you see between the foundational material that you can get in the book and then the way you have to apply it in school here and then throughout your life? Um, I think having this uh, opportunity to look at this material uh, gives you the uh, gives the student um, an advantage of being able to go on to more uh, stylistic and uses of this uh, 
in their lessons when they come to Berkeley. They, they won't have to uh, go through what is a melodic minor scale or how do I, you know, so it's a great um, step that actually gives the teacher the, and the student um, a step ahead of where they would have started um, with their lessons right at the beginning of the semester, which means that's into other material, uh, other uses, um, more advanced uses, and um, gives more time for stylistic teaching also in their lesson. You know, I, I like that. And I think like Cheryl, the part of the question I want to direct to you is people are ask us all the time, like, what's the secret, you know, to guitar playing and um, and ask Larry that for Berkeley, probably for all the 40 plus years you were here. And I think the thing about Berkeley is that what we really have decided and put central to the curriculum is the materials are the same. And they're all important no matter what style you have. So you don't just go down one style track and then you have to start completely over from scratch when you change styles. You learn this vocabulary so well, and then you learn how it fits in every style of music. And then the second part of the secret is you. Like the, is the way that you're going to practice the material and be able to demonstrate it in your playing for the rest of your time playing the guitar, which is far longer than you're here at Berkeley. So it's the way you practice it before you come. Like Larry said, that you get as prepared as you can, the way you use it when you're here at your level, when you're here and the way you learn to keep learning as you go. And that's kind of how I think of it. I think of the fact that we're centering all the materials that we have in common and not saying, well, if you're this guitarist, you shouldn't learn this. We're saying everybody's going to really learn the fretboard and learn about technique and learn about voice leading and learn about styles. And then you apply it as you go. Um, and that's kind of how I started to think about it. How about you, Cheryl? Like, how do you think about it? Well, um, I think about it in all those ways. And, uh, you know, as a musician or professional musician, you really don't know what direction things will go. And so hopefully you have a love and curiosity for music, all kinds of music, because you may be playing in a polka band or you might be playing in a heavy metal or a blues club or whatever. I mean, you know, I mean, I've been really, I've had kind of a really amazing career in that I've worked with West African musicians and singer songwriters and, and modern jazz players and swing jazz players and blues, you know, I mean, none of it was, I guess I I didn't set out to do that per se, but these are opportunities that came up. And that's what I always felt about studying all these things on the guitar is because then if I, if I have this fluidity in knowledge and musicianship developed, then I can try to do anything that comes my way. And that interests me. I mean, just being loving all music and being curious about music. So someone might say, well, I don't want to learn melodic minor as if they know exactly what their path is going to be. But that's sort of the path of a musician and an artist is, is there's an openness and you don't know what might inspire you. So maybe learning harmonic major is a new adventure for you. You know, why close yourself off to something that might inspire you to write something? Maybe this is going to be your, you know, something that really opens up a world of creativity to you. So, I mean, there's sort of that, that this gives you that ability to be open and flexible as a musician in your career. But for sure, even the most fundamental things, you know, intervals and triads, every day I play the guitar, I'm using them and I'm finding new ways and I'm I'm working on that with my metronome really slow. Like, hey, this is a way to play, um, you know, a three octave triad or even a one octave triad and make it sound beautiful like every day the guitar has that challenge the physicality of the instrument even though i understand the mechanics of it then there's the me applying the mechanics to it so it it is a lifelong thing and it gets deeper because you do find wow i could play you know you know your basic ways you use you could use triads 
you play reggae or you play funk or you play rock or you play pop you get but uh, wow that i could play a i could play an e triad over g or an g flat triad over g that's a whole different <laughs> sound and texture and color right so it keeps it it's the gift that keeps giving <laughs> go ahead but also it's discipline on the instrument in other words uh well why do i uh, maybe I don't want to play a harmonic major scale. Well, can you play a harmonic major scale? Do you have the discipline on the instrument? Um, all this, all these disciplines uh, give you more command of the instrument. And that's what we want, whatever style we're playing. We want command of the instrument so that when we're playing something, we're not worried about how to play it, but we're worried about where it fits in in the music and you're listening. You know, uh, there's a thing about, uh, I've had students um, and I've done it, you know, you're, you're playing a hard part and you're really working on it. And, you know, the band probably stopped and you're still playing because you're not listening. You have to listen while you play. So that, so you need the, the, uh, uh, the discipline and the uh, 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 you need to be able to play it while listening, while doing a lot of different things. So it's not always that you have to uh, just concentrate on your part. So having this discipline and knowing the instrument is uh, gives you that uh, that opportunity to make music other than play notes. And one other thing I want to say is when you go through this material, you find out everything is the same. You think the same with modes. You think the same with chords. You think the same. To me, chords are, are, are scales, scales, modes are chords, you know, uh, triads. They're all, it's all related. It's, we're a piano player. You know, guitar is really a, uh, such a, a diverse instrument that we're horn players. We're, we're, we're a piano player and um, it, we have to think like a horn player and actually, and then think like a, a piano player and then think like a guitarist and have it all together. I think there's some important things in what you both said. There's so many things to go back and listen to a couple different times. And one of them that I wanna highlight is this idea that more and more I don't know if this is really true or this is just our sense, but students feel like, and I think faculty feel like everyone's pulled in many, many different directions. And anytime you sit down and you say, I'm going to put time aside to work on something, there's a little part of you that says like, is this really worth it? Am I wasting my time? Like if I'm playing a one active triad, is that really going to get me where I need to be when I'm thinking about all these different pressures and worries that I have? And, and like what Larry was just talking about with the discipline of being able to sit down and do that. And I think there's really something to it when you know, when you pick up this book and when you look at the proficiency materials of Berkeley, like all of these incredibly committed, great players and great teachers have reviewed this material over the last 30 years, 40 years and said, yes, this is, this is it. You can trust this because we know this will work. Like we sat, you know, Cheryl's been in the latest incarnations and I was in the ones just before with Larry and then he and Rick and Mick Goodrick were in the ones before where everyone's fighting about, you know, what to call the modes and what to include and what not to include and really having like passionate discussions, like what's really essential for everyone. And then to be able to sit with you, Larry and Cheryl and Mick Goodrick at the same time and talk about, you know, what should stay, you know, in those early years of this particular review, um, starting in 2018 and, and saying, yeah. And um, there's something that, that um, I'm going to say another thing you said, Larry, in the book, I promise you, you said it because it's in the book, but you said like, you know, at a certain point, we just had to go with it, you know, go with the revisions and, and, you know, hope for the best. And this one has lasted like, and this one works like this is, this is really the best collection we can come up with as uh, faculty 
as your faculty, basically, if you're with us in the department, this is your way to come into the department if you're not already a student or an alum and see what we really think is worth your time. And so that can help. I find that comforting when I don't know what to practice and I'm a little worried that, you know, am I using my time the best way? You can never go wrong by by going into this book and looking at the proficiency material and practicing any one thing there. It will it will absolutely help you get better. And um, I think that's just true of it. And so I think that's a way to look at it instead of being overwhelmed by it. There's a comfort that, you know, this hasn't changed this book that I'm holding. Um, we've updated it and we've added to it, but it's been so consistent over the last four decades that I think we can trust it. And uh, I think you can trust it in your practice. Um, and Ben, I have a question for you about that. So like, as you're having this experience in your life that Larry and Cheryl are talking about, and that I'm talking about, um, can you think of something specific that was unexpected that was like a proficiency material that you were like, are you seriously, I have to learn this. And then later you found it very valuable. Uh, well, I, I guess probably the closest I had, I think it was my second semester. Mm -hmm. I was studying with Joan Wasella and, um, and he basically told me, he's like, all right, I'm going to show you like everything that you're going to need to know with all the other proficiencies, you know, with, with this one, it's basically what you said that, all right, well, if you know your, your modes, you know, your major scales, then you can just move that whatever one note you need to move to make it melodic minor, to make it harmonic major or harmonic minor. And kind of once he kind of phrased it that way, then it was just kind of like, you know, that aha moment. Then it's like, all right. So then going forward, every other proficiency, it's like, all right, well, level four harmonic minor well it's just minor scale now i just raise the seventh or you know for the harmonic major all right well i just you know i i bring bring down the six so for me that was really um something that i kind of knew even at that moment it's like all right that's going to be something that i'm going to be able to you know apply and take with me for the rest of my life but um and then you know it's really i think that you know you have like the the craft side of it and the artist side of it, right? So you have, and, and, and that's true, I think, with any skill, whether you're a guitar player or you're a chef or you're a painter or you're an athlete, it's like you, you have to have the discipline, like Larry said, to, you know, really hone in on your craft and be proficient in your craft. And then, you know, when it gets time to be able to apply all of that information, and then that that's kind of more the artist side is the application. It's like, it's like if you're a quarterback, you know, and you don't know the whole playbook, you know, and the, the defense is showing you one thing. It's like, but as a guitar player, it's like, you know, you don't want to miss out on opportunities because you aren't, you know, as much, you don't have your craft where it should be, right? The, the, the two separate things that have to be in balance with, it, with each other. Cheryl, what were some of the things that stood out to you as a person who like you went through it? in an older form as a student, then you came through a lot of the updates and changes as a faculty member for 20 more, 20 plus years. And then as assistant chair, kind of get coming into this project when you did, kind of like after Larry and I had started it, once you started as assistant chair, you, you came into it. Were there things that stood out to you or surprised you about different parts of the proficiency or things that you realized like, actually, you know what, that is, really valuable or, or you saw something in a different way? No, I just, well, I wouldn't say that because I, I do, I, I really am a product of the Berkeley guitar department, the way I see the instrument and way it's organized. And I always thought it was the best way. Um, I mean, I really, I'm not, and I'm not saying that from being biased. I just know that. And I know all the guitars that have come through here. Um, uh, I, I thought it was just really interesting, first of all, to, Larry's interview in there, which he denies that he did. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I thought that was real. I was really interested and fascinated to hear about this, those stories that I didn't really know about it. Um, and of course, just seeing the all the different, um, the material coming alive in all the different <laughs> that faculty wrote. you know I, I thought that was really 
that was very deep. I think it's deep. I'm really, I'm really proud. I'm honored to be, um, have been a part of it, at least towards the tail end there. And, and I know Kim, you did some incredible work with engraving and just being very meticulous. I know this was a very important project um, for you and congratulations, really. Thanks. And, and, and you know, Larry, um, also congratulations and, and good, good choice to have Kim working with you on. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's great. I'm really proud of it and um, honored to be a part of it and, and congratulations to you guys. Thank you. Uh, Kim, I have a question for you. Okay. Okay. Coming to Berkeley without a background to Berkeley, um, what are the, some of the things that struck you with the, the, um, with the curriculum? I think it's the guitar the, department. I think it's the smartest way to approach the guitar in the world that I've seen. And I, I went to, I mean, I loved my guitar education and I, I went to three incredible schools, um, to get my bachelor's master's and doctorate in performance. And, um, and then I taught at a variety of different schools, like from community colleges to, you know, liberal arts music programs to conservatory style music programs. And, um, I think this, that like, I'm very much like Ben, where I wish I had this approach to the fretboard in that that was missing from my education. I think because it's just missing from guitar education outside of Berkeley is how to really learn the fretboard in a way that makes it work for you and that it assists you in your, um, in your study of anything. And that, cause I think what happened to me was um, I loved all kinds of styles of guitar. And then I studied classical guitar at the best places in the world. You can do that. And from amazing teachers. And we all, I think it's fair to say, felt somewhat removed, like like it was a Rosetta Stone that we didn't understand when it came to any other style. And so I think one of the great things for me coming here from another place was to immediately start working on the proficiencies and like putting myself in there as a student. And then um, starting that in 2013, um, when I came, Larry, to work with you as assistant chair, it was like having these, like just a series of sort of, not really revelations, but like deeper and deeper waves of understanding with it, you know, and teaching private lessons with the materials and then working on them to teach labs and to teach um, recital workshop and, and to have students from different styles come in to study with me and realizing like, wow, this is a, a, a foundation that connects us. And then that's an easier way for me to show the things that are specific to me and the style that I chose to be my main style. Like I had a different language to relate those things that are also really valuable to people who play other things like about tone production and technique and um, voice leading in counterpoint and all those types of things, like the way we play different arpeggios, the way we think of things differently. It gave a common vocabulary to that, that I think was really valuable. And so um, I just, I, I completely agree with you and Cheryl that I think that this is the way. Also to be in the big discussions about what to call things and how you use them and why we would present them in a certain way. Um, I think it was just so incredible to be a part of this guitar department where you have 60, sometimes 50, sometimes 60 guitar faculty who can able, they can speak really passionately and really respectfully to one another. Um, and um, that's not something you always see in, in the professional community because there's just a professional reality of like some kinds of competition and that kind of thing, and whatnot. But here it was more, it was really just geared through this approach, like how do we serve everyone in the best way? And what can we each bring to it? Like what vocabulary would serve all of us in the way we serve the students? And and um, and I think that is a good thing to go into the world with as a community of guitar players that's, that's big and broad. And so um, it was really an honor to be a chair that got to go through it, you know, the way that you, when you came into the chair, Larry, and, and you went through, you know, Rick became your assistant chair from the faculty and, 
and you worked with Mick, it was an honor to be the chair and work with you as the emeritus and Mick as a person who is thinking about retiring and then Cheryl as a new assistant chair and sort of shepherd this way of, of organizing it maybe for some people who are more like me who are coming to it for the first time and wondering like why, why it's going to be valuable and, and what, what they could learn from it um, and get to put myself in that position. Um, it's a, it's really an honor. I feel like a steward of it, you know? Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty great. I mean, I, it's kind of unbelievable, really. It's like, uh, I had a friend who said, I know it sounds like a little cheesy, but I had a friend who came and visited me here and she said, it's like you, you moved to guitar heaven. And I was like, yeah, that's what it feels like. I think from the outside and, and like sometimes on the inside, we're so in the middle of it. You have to step back and think like, yeah, it's, it's pretty great. So that's how I think of it, you know? Um, that's been a really cool, cool experience. Um, Cheryl, what else is on your mind with it? With um, this? Yeah, I mean, it, well, it, it, it's amazing that it's, it's here. And I, I know it's going to be for folks that are curious about the program. It's going to be so helpful and, you know, for mm -hmm. all our global partners. And uh, and for alum who are, I know are going to buy it and they're going to go back and look at things and keep working on things and share it with their students. Um, so um, and it was it was interesting to see the process of it and you know all the <laughs> hours of proofreading and just making sure things were right you know that we represented it right. So I'm really I'm excited about it. I think uh, it's epic. Yeah, it's epic. I want to thank Ian Steed, who mm. was, was with us in past incarnations of the podcast, because Ian was our proofreader of every diagram, Larry. He did it two times. Every diagram, every fingering, every scale degree. That's something, you know? <laughs> That's really something that he did that. So I appreciate him. And then a series of our alums who as students went through early musical examples and, and worked with us on it. And, um, and Ben, for all of your advice as we were going through to make it practical. Um, I really appreciate all of that. Um, I think, um, I think it's going to be a great tool for, for so many people and a lot of surprising things. And um, Ben, I want to say that like in the pandemic, this happened, you know, it, it ended up going through the pandemic. We didn't know when we started that would happen, but you had this, Ben developed this thing, like to keep everybody together in all the emails um, you would write guitarists stick together at the end of every, every email that you sent out to all the students and, you know, to give, you know, we were thinking about what can you hang on to, to feel like a part of the community and feel like you're on track in some way with your playing. And, and so at the end of the introduction, I, I did quote you a little bit. I put, we're in this together because this is how um, we can, we can kind of stick together with all the materials. Um, and I think that helps. I know it, it sounds a little crazy, but if you feel like you belong to something, I think it helps you get through the harder parts of the practice day and the practice years. So um, on behalf of all of us, I want to say to people who are listening, like, welcome to the guitar department. Go pick up the book and dig in there and get to know the teachers and, and know the program through um through what we really put a lot of heart and soul and, and time and energy into um, in my time. And then in, in all of Larry's time, which is like, it's, I don't want to say this out loud too loud, Larry, but that's almost 50 years that you've been working on this stuff. Yeah. Don't say it too loudly. Okay. <laughs> Nobody heard that. Right. Like, but um, Larry, what a tremendous accomplishment for you that, that you've put together something that's lasted half a century and will keep going. Like, I think that's one thing that, that we really had to be honest with doing this book is like, is this the way of the next 50 years? And I think we think it is. Well, it's, it's not me. It's the guitar department. Right. Yes. Everybody together. We learn from each other, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. So I think uh, it was wonderful that you had these heated discussions about uh, what to put in, which I think 
uh, we, Rick and I had heated discussions with the department and, and all, and we learned from each other. Uh, you know, how do, how do uh, guitars first learn they play with somebody? And they say, well, how did you do that? You know, so we, we learn from each other playing and talking about the important stuff. And why did you do that? And what are you thinking when you did that? You know? <laughs> right, right. Or what are you, what are you doing? No, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So all I want to say is that the last thing is um, what Ben said, he used the word proficient. And that's where we, why we have a proficiency is to have people become proficient on the instrument, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's the really root of the word that, uh, and the reason. Yeah. I mean, and Larry, I think you did the huge haul of all of this work when you welcomed so many people of different styles into the guitar department on the faculty and made space for everybody. You know, you made space for me as a classical guitarist and you made space for the rock players and the blues players and the funk and fusion players. And, um, it's so much like the world because you did that. And then that allowed for everybody to come together and say like, what would be good for everybody? You know? So that, that uh, is such a legacy here that Cheryl and I um, and Ben and, and Annika now in our office, we get to steward. So um, we're doing our best. We're going to keep it going um, because it really has its own life now as the Berkeley guitar department. But that was quite a, it was quite a leap of faith that you took and um, it took a lot of uh, musicianship and, and teaching ability and, and just forward thinking and a lot of compassion, I think, to build the guitar department that we have that you did. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. And I also have to uh, thank Rick for working with me and helping me yeah. with that and all. Yes. Rick Packer. We're, we're so lucky that Rick is here as a um, distinguished professor and, um, he's here full time and we still have sessions like where he comes in to give me advice called things. Rick tells Kim. That's what he oh, calls it. <laughs> and Jim Kelly, who's yeah. been here um, for almost 50 years now, um, yeah. who came in with you as a, as a teacher. And right. so we're so lucky to have um, Rick as the, as another chair who's here on the faculty with us. It's like Cheryl and I are chairs and then we have you as Emeritus and Rick here on the faculty. And then um, all of our incredible full-time teachers who have been here a long time. And, and then now some new people who are bringing their new energy and their perspective on this stuff when they were here as, um, as young students and some of them in our time, you know, um, yeah. when I, since I've been here. So, um, so it's a, it's a really cool community effort. I think it's a group effort and, um, and we really work together as you always say. Um, so, so thank you so much. Um, thank you, Larry. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you everyone. It's wonderful to talk about this and seeing you, all of you. Thanks. Good to see you. And thank you, Cheryl Bailey for, uh, for being here and thank you, Ben Cody. Um, and we're going to stay and hang out for a little while longer, but if you're listening, we'll be with you all on the next Coffee Talk. <laughs>